Uh, good evening and welcome to our a business meeting of September 26, 2024. We have some students here that are going to lead us in the pledge, so please rise. Okay, you guys are going to start it, okay? And everyone will join. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent work. Nice. Great job, job guys. Good job. They don't rush it. It's perfect. It was perfect. Well done. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to open it up to the public for to speak on any of the listed agenda items. Okay. Um, then we're going to start um, with. Uh, we're going to move things around a little. We're going to start with our um, presentations, and I'm going to ask the external auditors. Pro Connor Davies for fiscal for the fiscal year ending June 2024. Jeremy, you want to introduce him? Just want to welcome Jeffrey Shaver, partner from O'Connor Davies. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Jeff Shaver, partner with PKF O'Connor Davies. Happy to be here to present the results uh, of the audit for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2024. I did meet with the audit committee uh, prior to this meeting, went over everything in more detail for tonight's presentation. Just going to give a high level summary uh, of the audited financial statements and answer any questions anyone on the board might have. Um, the, the audit report includes three separate uh, auditor's documents or auditor's reports. One is um, the main audit of the financial statements. Happy to report that we have issued an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. It's also referred to as a clean opinion and it's the most favorable opinion that you can receive. What that means is the numbers in the financial statements and the disclosures are complete and they're accurately stated. There is also a report required by governmental auditing standards, which is a report over internal controls over financial reporting. In that report, we'd be required to tell you whether we identified any material weaknesses in your internal controls. I'm happy to report that that's also a clean audit report. The third and final report is a report over uh, compliance over your federal programs. And that's where we, as auditors, are required to look more specifically at the compliance attributes of the federal dollars that were spent by the district during the fiscal year. I'm also happy to report uh, we've issued an unmodified opinion uh, over compliance over the federal programs. And again, that's, that's an unmodified uh, report, clean report, the most favorable that you can receive. In terms of uh, financial highlights, if you're following along in the financial statements, the uh, bigger book, <laughs> I'd like to take you to page 58. This is the general fund, schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, budget and actual for the year end of June 30th, 2024. This is a five column presentation. The first column is the original budget as adopted by the voters and the board. The second column is the final budget encompassing any amendments or transfers that were approved by the board during the year. The third column is your actual results. Fourth column is your encumbrances or purchase orders that will carry over into the subsequent year's budget, followed by the variance column, which is a calculation of the final budget, less the actual and the encumbrances. In terms of the revenue side of the general fund budget, the original budget anticipated collections of $56,594. Uh, that was revised during the year to $57,044,000, while the actual revenues for the year were $60,493,000 approximately 3.5 million greater than what was, what was anticipated to be collected. Um, how did you achieve that favorable variance? Uh, uh, approximately a million dollars in interest income greater than the budget as the interest rates in the market were quite 
higher than what was anticipated in the budget. Uh, state aid was a million dollars greater than the budget as the state uh, fully funded the foundation aid. Uh, the budget didn't, didn't completely uh, capture all that, that increase. So that was a million dollars favorable. And the miscellaneous income was approximately 1.5 million greater than the budget for what we call refund of prior year expenditures for grants and certain accruals that were reversed in the previous year and recorded as revenue uh, in, in this year. Uh, and that brings you roughly to the total of about three and a half million of the favorable surplus in the revenue side of the budget. In terms of the expenditure side of the budget or appropriation side, the initial budget anticipated rev uh, expenditures of 56,115,000, and that was revised slightly to 56,199,000, while your actual expenditures were 52,945,000 after accounting for open purchase orders of 622,000 that resulted in a favorable budgetary variance of approximately $2.6 million. That was offset by an unfavorable variance in a transfer that was budgeted from the debt service fund that was never made. Um, that was an optional transfer that wasn't made because the other var various surpluses in the general fund um, didn't, didn't require the use of, of, of that transfer. So that brings uh, a, a total budgetary variance, positive budgetary variance of about 5,030,000 um, from the budget. When the budget was adopted, it was a balanced budget. No uh, fund balance was utilized when the budget was adopted. The only balancing figure in the first column and second column, you see the number on the bottom, 475,000. That represented your open purchase orders from the previous year. So those were, items that the district committed to spending at June 30th, 2023, but hadn't received the goods or services. So those numbers automatically roll forward. So that represents a use of fund balance or plan use of fund balance for this fiscal year. So when you take that plan use of fund balance and compare it to the budgetary surplus of about $5 million, it brings you to your actual accounting surplus, your real surplus. And that number was 5,177,000 for the fiscal year into June 30th, 2024. So the general fund started the year with fund balance of 14518000 ended the year at 19695000 I just want to take you quickly through on page 48, if you're following along, shows the detail of all the fund balance categories. Um, the first column on page 48 is the general fund, and again on the bottom, the total fund balance, 19695000 of that 19695000 $382,000 is non-spendable related to bills paid during the fiscal year end of June 30, 30th, 2024 that, rep that, accounted, uh, that accounted for expenses for 2025. So because the cash has already been spent, it's earmarked that you can't spend it again. Uh, the restricted fund balance is a total of $15,869,000. Uh, consisting of tax certiorari reserve at 1.4 million, employee benefit accrued liability or teacher and, and employee uh, compensated absences that will be paid out upon uh, retirement or leave, the retirement contribution reserve, about $3 million, the teacher's retirement contribution reserve at about $2 million, and finally, uh, the future capital projects, um, about $7 million. That was a, a voter-approved capital reserve that um, allowed the district to put money in reserve up to uh, approximately $10 million. And that was in addition to an older capital reserve um, that the district did years ago. So the two of them combined uh, has a total savings or, or reserve balance of the $7 million. There's also a signed fund balance um, or earmarked fund balance, if you will, for purchases on order, again, commitments that the district has that won't be spent until the next fiscal year of 622,000. The earmark in the 2025 budget for use of fund balance, and that number is 399,000, bringing you to a total assigned fund balance of about a million dollars. And the, the leftover balance of fund balance, I sometimes refer to it as a residual fund balance, 
uh, in accounting language here, it's listed as unassigned fund balance. That's limited to 4% of the subsequent year's budget by state law. And that number is 2,422,000. The district is currently at, at the maximum amount allowed under New York state law. Okay. Um, that's uh, all the remarks I had for the board tonight. Um, if there's anything you'd like me to go through in greater detail, or if any of the students have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> Sam, questions? The, the total fund balance that, that we have acquired, including capital projects and everything else, that, that's within the state's mandate? We're, we're okay with that? The, the full amount? The 4% mandate only relates to what we call here as unassigned fund balance. Okay. okay. So the rest of them, they are restricted by law generally. The, the, the restricted fund balance, those are all um, legal reserves in that um, they're allowed for an education law or general municipal law or local finance law, those uh, sorts uh, of understood. things. So they are restricted. Um, they're just different from the 4%. Outside of the 4%. Outside of, outside, of, outside of the, okay. All right. So we're in that, uh, we're, we're in the safe zone then at this point in time. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good okay, I'm going to ask um, for comments from the audit committee um, representative um, Tom. Oh, there you are. Um, Tom Sawyer was elected chairman again, yay, of the audit committee. <laughs> we are grateful for his service. How, how close was the vote? <laughs> I won by a landslide last time. Definitely <laughs> not as close as our budget vote. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jeff and the team, for uh, uh, for their audit. It was very very thorough. We reviewed all the artifacts from that. Uh, we agree with the findings, and the audit committee has voted to accept the audit report and submit it to the board. Uh, thank you also to Grace, and, and welcome. So I uh, look forward to working with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next presentation this evening will be our elementary school opening of schools report. So I'd like to invite up Dr. Margaret Podesta and Mrs. Carly Roby. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. I am Margaret Podesta, and I'm here with Carly Roby, our assistant principal. I also have some colleagues here and some very special students who are here to help us present on the opening of schools at Putnam Valley Elementary School. This is a very exciting time of year always, a nice fresh start and lots of opportunity ahead. The theme of opportunity, of course, is big in our district this year, and there's an opportunity every day to do our best, to learn a lot, and to be the best people we can be. We have a new look at the elementary school. Here it is. We have a very fancy, fresh color in the hallways. Sometimes looks gray, purple, blue, or even pink. Either way, it is gorgeous, it is bright, and it's a nice, fresh look for a school that's been standing for a while. I do want to thank Dave Spittle, Ray Renzo, our entire custodian team, and the summer workers who worked so hard down to the trim on every door. Um, it, it just looks like a brand new building, and it's just such a pick-me-up. So we do thank everyone for this investment and for the hard work that went into it. It's, it's beautiful. A quick review of last year. We had a very busy and productive last year at Putnam Valley Elementary. It was a full year of scholastic literacy again, with lots of professional development taking place throughout the year, looking at our reading program, really focusing on our ELA station rotations, our small group learning in line with the science of reading. And this professional development went on with one of our staff members, Carrie Burdett, who leads the way in our learning with Scholastic. She does a wonderful job. She's also a first grade teacher. Um, we also continued with our foundations, our phonics program, with turnkey training, especially with Teresa Bork, one of our teacher leaders in that area. Our RTI process was refined even more so to make it efficient, very student-centered, making sure that our students get what they need as part of the whole MTSS umbrella in schools. Our science lab was a very busy place last year. The New York State tests have changed. New York State investigations with grades three and four came our way. We did lots of learning. We have a wonderful teacher aide, Mrs. Bross, in the science lab who helps facilitate materials and 
hands-on experiment so that science learning is meaningful and very connected to the world around us. We began library book exchange with Mrs. Medina last year, who is in our library again this year. And so children go to the library every two weeks, take home books, support their reading that they do every day. We celebrated the Mandarin program, which had been in Putnam Valley for at least five years. And we have some children I know in the high school who really their foundation was at elementary with the language Mandarin, and they are very connected to that language and growing with it. Um, however, that contract ended, and we're excited to tell you in a little bit about Spanish exposure in our elementary school in a very creative way. We also last year introduced the Hegarty program, which is a part of reading which is proven to be extremely important for young readers. Yes, we want to teach decoding, we want to teach phonics, we want to teach letter identification and letter sounds, but children really know, need to know how to rhyme, how to break up words, how to change words by changing the vowels or the consonants at the beginnings and ends of words, and just having that awareness. So you will hear from Mrs. McCarty tonight talking a little bit about the Hegarty, which is now fully in place in our K through two classrooms. Here's Carly. <laughs> So I said this last year and I'm going to say it again, I have never been in an elementary school that is so alive throughout the summer and it's such a special place to be. There were students almost every single day in our buildings. We had our extended year program in the elementary school with not only our own students but with our middle school and high school students coming to see us as well, which is such a treat. We hosted our summer boost where students could come in and just kind of get a refresher and mindset shift before the school year started and remember what it's like to be in school. Our kinder camp welcomed some of our youngest learners to introduce them to what school is going to look and feel like. We were able to do our kindergarten bus run and have the whole incoming kindergarten students come and join us and take a bus ride with a parent orientation and a visit to their classrooms. We also did something that, again, is special to Putnam Valley, the kindergarten back to school night happened before school even started. So these parents get to come in, they get to meet the teacher, they get to see the classroom before sending their little ones off to the unknown to help feel a little more secure. And finally, we were able to host our new student orientation. When students move in over the summer, instead of walking into an unknown space, they get to come in, meet us, take a tour of the building, and meet the families, which is super special. It's also busy with adults. There is learning that's happening throughout the whole summer. We had our big master schedule committee meeting so that it's not just one person making the schedule. All voices are heard and thought about and collaborated with. Our writing instruction team gathered with for two days. We had two teacher leaders hold training, one about our decodables, which are becoming more and more in use with the science of reading, and again with our Hegarty training. Our grade levels met and did their curriculum work and produced artifacts. Same with our department meetings. And then on superintendent conference day, we again had two teacher leaders and they hosted literacy stations training and the writing revolution training. And so I introduced the uh, program of Hegarty, which is just really eight to 10 minutes a day, but the real expert in the room, and she's not calling herself an expert, but she's becoming a teacher leader in this area, is Mrs. Kristen McCarty. So I'd like to invite her up to talk about it a little bit. Thank you for having me. And I know I have some of my first grade friends, um, family members who didn't have a choice also <laughs> joined me. Um, but I do have to say thank you to the parents for bringing them in on a Thursday night after a long week. So thank you to all of the parents. I'm very grateful. Um, so with Hegarty, it is a heavy, um, um, there's a heavy emphasis on phonemic awareness. Um, and what exactly is phonemic awareness? Many don't aren't sure and don't know. Um, it is the ability to recognize, identify, and mani manipulate the individual sounds or phonemes, as what they're called, in spoken words. So really, it's auditory. It's what we hear. 
Um, it's how we can manip manipulate what we hear um, before we even get to print. Um, it's also an important skill in both reading and writing, and it can also be a strong indicator of reading and spelling readiness and success. So um, with the Hegarty program, there's a heavy instructional focus on sounds we hear in words. Um, lessons are an oral and auditory warm-up to phonics instruction, where that's where print um, starts to come in. And then students isolate, blend, and segment, or break apart, and ma manipulate sounds in spoken words. So this is just an example of the manual. <clears throat> It's, it's literally a lesson plan right in front of us. Um, most mm -hmm. teachers, including myself, um, have it on my lap as I'm teaching the lesson. Um, on the left column is all of the different skills that we are working on every day. It's pretty much the same skills every single day. Um, rhyme recognition, initial sounds, blending syllables and sounds, um, final, recognizing the final sound. There's also um, changing sounds to make new words. Um, and then it gets into early literacy skills, which is where you can um, start talking about and introducing words and sentences, how many words are there in a sentence. And um, it, it starts to bring in some print in terms of letters and the sounds that those letters make. Um, so. I would like my first grade friends to come on up and sit right in front of the chair, just like in school. We're pretending we're in the elementary school. And we're going to do a, just a quick lesson on what we do every day in the classroom. Um, and you're welcome to join in. Pretend you're in first grade again. didn't rhyme. Um, and now we are beginning producing rhymes. So um, here we go. You ready? OK. Um, so I'm going to say a word. It's a nonsense word. And it has to do with something you find at school. You'll tell me a word that rhymes with that nonsense word. You ready? OK. So I'm thinking of a word that rhymes with stooks. You can just call out. Books. Excellent. How about a word that rhymes with slew? Good job. They're all things that you find at school. How about fizzers? Fizzers. Amazing. Tarkers. Tarkers. Good job. And Wenzels. Wenzels. Amazing. All right, so now we're going to listen for the first sound in a word, OK? I say a word, you say a word, then you tell me the first sound. Octopus. Ah, great. Motion. Motion. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Violin. Violin. Mm -hmm. Good job. Now we are going to blend sounds together to make words, OK? I am going to say sounds. You copy me. You could get your choppers out. And then you're going to blend the word together, OK? You ready? N, et. Awesome. Uh, good. Uh, good. Uh, awesome. Good app. Good app. Yeah. Great. What I did. What I did. Why? Very nice. Now we are listening for the last sound in a word. I will say a, sa a word, you say a word, and then we'll say it again and punch that last sound. You ready? Okay, get your arms ready. Stood. 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 Yeah. Good job. Shark. 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 Great. Praise. 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 Very nice. Crown. 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 Good job. All right, so now, it's OK. Now I'm going to give you a word. It's your time to chop it up. I'll give you a word, you say the word, and then you chop it into sounds, OK? 
wet. Yep, don't say it again after, though. That's okay. <laughs> Doug. Perfect. Tap. Tap. Good job. One more. Side. Side. Amazing. Good job. All right, so now I'm going to say part of a word. And we can add a sound to the beginning and make a new word. You're going to tell me what the new word is. You ready? Say, ode. ode. Add k to the beginning. What's the word? Ode. Very good. Say, ope. Ode. Good. Add er to the beginning, and the word is? Ode. Awesome. Say, oak. Ode. Add j to the beginning, and the word is? Ode. Great job. One more. Say oat. oat. Add v to the beginning and the word is? Oat. Amazing. All right, so now we can take away a sound and you're going to tell me what's left. It's getting a little trickier, okay? Say bone. bone. Without b, what's left? Oh. Awesome. Say code. code. Without k, what's left? Oh. Awesome. Say rope. Without er, what's left? Oh. And say joke. joke. Without j, what's left? Oh. You're like experts already. All right, now the trick. One of the trickiest. You ready? I'm gonna say a word, and I'm gonna change the beginning sound. You'll tell me the new word. You ready? Okay. Say kite. kite. Change k to n, and the word is. Nice. Amazing. Very good. Say night. Change n to t, and the word is? Tight. Good. You guys are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Say tight. Tight. Change t to b, and the word is? Tight. Awesome. Say <coughs> might. Nice. Change m to r, and the word is? Right. Good job. Amazing. All right, so now I have a couple of letter cards. I'm not making you do all of them like we do in school. And you're going to tell me the letter and the sound it makes. OK? All right, so letter is? E. Sound is? E. Good job. Letter is? E. Sound is? E. Good. We'll do one more. Letter is? E. Sound is? E. Awesome. All right, last one. This is the, my class's favorite part of the Hegarty lesson, not because it's the end. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say a sentence, you repeat it, then you're going to count the words in the sentence. You ready? Okay. Today is Thursday. Today is Thursday. Today is Thursday. Thursday. Show me. Yep, today is Thursday. Good job. All right, we'll do two more. Watch out for muddy puddles. Watch out. Watch out for muddy puddles. Good job. All right. This was one of my favorites. I like pancakes for breakfast. 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 Awesome job. And that's it. for anything better. Thank you. So I abbreviated it. I didn't do as many words as we normally do during the day. It's late. It's getting close to bedtime. But um, yeah, it's a quick thing. Um, it's planned for us. There's very little that teachers need to do. Um, and I've already seen a difference in their writing, mm -hmm. not just with sounds and spelling, but also understanding how many words are in the sentence that they're thinking about. Um, and I see them counting when they're writing on their own. So it's been very exciting. So thank you. And thank you again. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Would you guys like to take a picture before you leave? Yeah. yeah I think all right, one. Okay. So you come up and say your names, and then you guys can all line up with Dr. Protesta, Ms. Roby, and Mrs. McCarty, and we'll take a picture. Come see your name. What's your name? Meredith. Meredith. Meh. Good 
Yeah, how about you? Sawyer McCarty. <laughs> he didn't have a choice. <laughs> Benjamin Cummings. <laughs> Kylie Watke. Kaylee Singleton. Kevin Singleton. Julia Contini. Rose Marinelli. And Grace Gallagher. Good job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So while they're posing, Aiden and Phil, what are you very different from what you remember in first grade? Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you want to get in? Do you want to get in? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank Great you. job, Thank boys you. and girls. We're so proud of you. Amazing. Amazing. Dr. Podesta, just a quick question. Back in the ancient days, there was a thing called whole language. You remember that? Is this a derivative of that, or, or mm -mm. It, it seems... Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. Yeah. No. no, this is... This is, oh, is this on anymore? Okay. It's on now. Okay, great. Yes, no, this is really a focus on the letters, the letter sounds, breaking apart words, and really looking at letters and sounds in detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As they actually are. As they are, mm -hmm. yeah. As opposed to the whole language, which mm -hmm. made yes. up letters and things. Yeah. <laughs> good. And, and really, good um, it's not even attached to print at that point. Right. This yeah. is really hearing sounds and hearing what's a whole word, what is a whole sentence, how many parts of the sentence. I just want to thank Kristen McCarty. That was outstanding. That was outstanding. Thank you. Kristen actually took a two-hour workshop last mm -hmm. year virtually. I mean, that's really where it all started. Mm -hmm. But since then, she's been practicing and working. And it doesn't look that hard until you're sitting in exactly. front of a group of students who are watching every move you make. Mm -hmm. And um, that I think Hegarty might be hiring you. We have to be very careful. Yeah. I think and the most impressive part was not that they knew the correct answer, but they spoke in a single voice right. every right. single time. Yeah, they're not even all in the same class. Yeah. Not even, uh, not at all. Yeah, and they're just so well behaved. Just amazing. Yeah, they're well, in different first grade classes. Well, when she started, when she was explaining it, I'm like, I want to see somebody do it. Like, like what? Yeah. What are they doing? Doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great to see that, um, and to see students actually in in action doing that. I, I know that it's time consuming, but it's also like visual. And I noticed that, that it's also physical in that there's movement involved so that like all the parts of their brain are working yes. together, which is huge. It's and a very multi-sensory approach and, yeah. and that's very important. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's nice for the Board of Ed to see where our children start. I mean, these aren't even kindergartners, they're big first graders now, but many times we get to see the high school amazing presentations at these meetings and you know first they're learning letter sounds with That's us right. and learning how to be in school and um, i'm just so proud of them so thank you all right so here are how many students we have this year and so our kindergarten class came in a very small numbers this year we only have four sections general ed se sections one of them of course at every grade level being a collaborative section ict but we have 83 students in kindergarten. Grade one, 92. Grade two is a little bigger, 115. Grade three, 107. And grade four is our big class. We lost a big class going to middle school last year, and now we do have six sections of fourth grade still with 133 students. So last year at this time, we had 573 students at the elementary school. This year, we have 530. We lost a big class and we gained a small class. Based on student need, we were able to have a K-2 full day achieve class this year. So we have two full day achieve classes, self-contained classes. Some of the children do push into other classes for subject areas and for specials. And we also, of course, have our New Horizons classes K-2 and 3-4. 
we do have a lot going on with writing this year. Writing is our major focus in our elementary school. We've really been working with reading in a very detailed way. And so this year we're focusing on writing instruction and what that looks like. As Mrs. Roby said, we had two full days with our building level writing team. Many of us also belong to the K-12 writing committee. Um, but what we're looking at, at, and just like looking at skills and details of reading and text, we're looking at skill-based learning with writing. We are trying to give our students the basic skills needed to be sophisticated and avid writers. So the explicit instruction of writing skills is a focus for us at all grade levels. We're looking at sentence expansion, using text evidence in our writing to support our claims, whether it be for science or it be for an essay or an argumentative piece, a persuasive piece. And we're really focusing on what's important, spelling, grammar, and punctuation. We've looked at the benchmarks. We have a writing prompt that was given to all of our students last year, K through four. We looked at the benchmark expect expectations at each grade level. We looked at high, medium, and low samples of, at all grades. We posted them in our conference room for all teachers to look at. And from there, we're developing further benchmarks and looking at our instruction. So we have a year ahead of hard work with writing. It is hard work, but we're excited about it. And we want to prepare them for what they're expected to be writing and doing in middle school and high school. So along with all the curriculum and initiatives, we also have a lot of areas of student support. Uh, in the spring, we were able to host a springtime reading academy where students were invited to come in some mornings before school and were given a little extra guided reading or decodable boost. We also have our eye block, which is a time for pullout for different services, but it's also a really big instructional time that gives teachers the opportunity in the classroom to work with those students at exactly what they need. So whether it's reading groups, whether it's writing support, whether it's math lessons or even enrichment for some students, while other students are in various places in the building. It's no new content, but it's really individualizing that instruction for each child. We have students that visit our speech teachers. We have our occupational therapists, our physical therapists. We have ENL students and counseling groups that are all taking place during that period. We also have our AIS teachers that work with groups during this time in reading and math, and that's really differentiated, again, for their specific needs. We also are implementing those decodable books to help students, if this is what we're explicitly teaching you of how to break down words, now we're going to give you the text that's what I've taught you to see how you're able to read it. We also are fortunate to have those AIS teachers do some pushing into the classroom in the mornings for math and reading support as well. We also have our teaching assistants that a few of them are able to do even additional instruction and guided groups or foundations practice. That's kind of, we call it like half a tier. It's that in between a little bit of extra boost for people that we're able to do. And we really can monitor all of this carefully through our quarterly data meetings. Along with that is one of the biggest um, things in Putnam Valley, and that's our community. And it's all about opportunity. In our elementary school, there are so many opportunities to invite the community in and to work with the community. So we already had the welcome back picnic, which was such a fun time for our students and families. We'll be welcoming our first responders soon for a visit to the school. Parent communication happens on a daily basis, whether it's with Dr. Podesta or myself, the classroom teacher, newsletters, the weekly word, there's just a plethora of ways that parents are communicated with. We have our community read day. The PTA hosts many, many weekend events. We have our flag day ceremony. We invite our seniors from the high school to come back and do their cap and gown walk through the building, which is so exciting. We love when our sports teams do well and we get to host a parade at the elementary school and we have um, ongoing holiday celebrations and parades and sing-alongs throughout the year. 
Another exciting outcome of last year was the hard work that our building steering committee did throughout the year. And this committee um, consisted of parents, we had a board member on the committee, we have administrators, and of course um, teachers from every grade level. So what we did is we came together with no set agenda. We opened it up to discussion, to questions, to issues that needed to be discussed. And we really have talked about the connection and communication with community. And we know that we're always trying to communicate, but thinking about how we can answer questions and help parents, whether they, they're brand new kindergarten families or they're brand new to Putnam Valley, they just moved in. And guess what? This turned out to be something that's helpful to people who might have lived here for 10 years, but they just <laughs> didn't know some of the things that we included in this very full um, document. It's a live document. So it's now posted on the elementary website. That's a real live QR code. It could actually be used with your phone right now to take you right to the live document that you may have seen on the website. All of the QR codes were actually attached to all of our elementary school students' homework folders this week. So if parents want to go and take a look at what is on there, it's almost endless. It's everything from school services, what is for lunch today, how do you sign up for town baseball, what does RTI mean, how do I check out a library book, how do I find out about Girl Scouts, um, it's where do I pay my taxes? It, it, is, it is all of the information we could think of with our building steering committee that might be helpful to parents of the community. It's going to be, it, it is live. We can change it. It's in Spanish. And um, I'm, I'm just really excited about this project because I think it helps connect all of us together. It's helpful, it's informative, and we're going to keep it up to date. I'd like to thank Crystal for her input with um, our document, and we'll just continue to make it better and better because um, I, think it, I think it will be used. I really do. And the QR codes are out and about. <laughs> <laughs> Parent engagement just goes along with that. We want our parents to be involved, we want our parents to be heard, and we want our parents to be communicated with so that they feel comfortable joining the PTA, joining the wonderful Putnam Valley Education Foundation. We've had speakers from both those organizations at our back to school night. We, we're collaborating with our local library for um, a chance for our students to read and rate books for the library. We're actually helping them with that. We've had back to school nights very early in the year, K2 and 3-4 with great attendance. We've had last year our ELA parent workshop, which we will do again, ENL nights for families that we'd like to grow and actually have a couple throughout the year, we're hoping. Our building steering committee will take on a new project this year. We'll have to decide what that will be. Our classroom events are ongoing, especially our writing celebrations, our concerts, our shows and um, the moving up ceremony is always extra special, celebrating our fourth graders, because those years really do go by very quickly. This year we're able to add in even more character education and diversity, so what we did is we created um, a theme for each month this year, and we are holding community meetings by grade levels to discuss what that theme is. Uh, for example, September was positive thinking. So we had a meeting with each grade level. What is positive thinking? How can we show positive thinking throughout the day? There's also a common book each month that goes along with the theme that every single student will be hearing. So you, any teacher can reference that within the school. We're continuing with our tiger paws and celebrating positive behaviors for classrooms. And we are just continuing with more assemblies and more classroom lessons and the SEL lessons are continuing in our meetings and just that common vocabulary throughout the building for our students. As I mentioned, we want our children exposed to other languages. And so we just happen to have a gift of a wonderful aide in the library who's also completely fluent in Spanish. And so we thought, hey, what can we do with this? So <laughs> she was more than willing. She is not designing lessons. She's not giving Spanish classes. But the library is a place where the children visit on a regular basis.
basis. And I have a video, short, short video, to show you what Mrs. Jackie Medina is doing with her Spanish skills and just her wonderful way with children. Um, the library is a very busy place. She's hosting book clubs on her own. She'd like to host book clubs during recess time. She's um, collaborating with the local library. She partners with teachers to find resources in the library to help students learn and research. There are games and books and poems. Some of them are in English right now, and if children want to learn a little Spanish, that is available. So right now, I think this will work, let's see. It's just naturally integrated into yeah. the day. It's not time out of the teacher's academic schedule. Um, and the children are so excited about it. And guess what? So is Mrs. Medina. It's wonderful. <laughs> so we're excited about her, for sure. Um, okay. I might need help. <laughs> you didn't want me to go to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so along with all of this wonderful creative um, presentation that we have, I want to tell you that our data is still extremely strong. This is very important to us that our students succeed academically, that they are challenged, and that they rise to the highest bar that they can. Now, we do not have the spring 2024 um, data all set to show you, but we're excited to show you that in the near future. This is from spring 2023, and we actually met, Jackie Levine and administrators met with um, the school meter um, person today just to explain our data, to take a look at what these graphs mean. So very proudly, I say that these are third and fourth grade um, boxes that show you that in ELA on the left and in math on the right, we are in the top decile of the state in our state test scores for grades three and four ELA and math. So in fourth and third grade, in fourth grade in this year, spring 2023, we were in the top 10% of New York State. And you know in 2019, we were in the top 3%. So I don't have that down to the percentage, this is us compared to New York State. When we compare our scores to Westchester and Putnam, some of the highest achieving schools in the state, um, we're first in math, okay? So let's just say it, number one. Um, and that's all Westchester County. So will we be that this year? I don't know, but we'll be up there because we have a very strong math curriculum. We have very strong math teachers from kindergarten up through fourth grade and our support. And our ELA is also strong. Some of what we see in our scores is our transition to a new reading program where teachers were learning, trying new strategies. And so we might have gone to the second decile in some areas, but we're still extremely um, proud of the work that our students do, proud of our teachers who are amazing at professional learning and then transferring that learning to the classroom. And I want our parents to know that our students go to a very strong school and that our um, academics are extremely strong. We're also fortunate enough to offer many different clubs for our students. The fourth graders uh, started Safety Patrol today, I believe was the first day. They were very excited to take their posts and this new responsibility within the school. There's the gym show, which is always exciting. We have our Kids of Character Club, and it focuses with um, sustainability as well. Our Science and Maker Club, 
our Earth Helpers. The musical was such a success last year and we're very excited to see what they come up with this year, especially with our new music teacher as well. Um, and we actually are adding two new clubs this year. One is called a Kindness Club and we are also going to be offering a Sign Language Club for our yeah. students. As we look to the year ahead and the year of opportunity, I mentioned that writing instruction is a very strong focus for all of us, K through four. We'll continue our focus with small group learning, rotations within the classroom so that the teacher can work with a small group at one time and the other students are well versed at working at what they're doing, whether they're talking with other students at their table with work that they're doing or working independently. The iBlock instruction focus, the iBlock is actually an opportunity every day. It's, it's a time when teachers can really focus in on particular students and their needs. Science lab planning with the investigations, we've adjusted the use of the science lab a bit to make sure that the classes that need the most time with the hands-on work in the lab are getting that. So that took a lot of collaboration and we're seeing how it goes so far, so far so good. We do have a change. Fourth grade must take computer-based state tests this year. Yes. So our fourth graders will join the classes who in other grade levels have started that already. Our third graders will continue to take paper-based tests this year. Our teachers really collaborated and decided let's put one more year on it and so we'll wait for that. And of course, our character ed and diversity has a new look with Mrs. Roby and I really leading the way, but the support of the wonderful teachers who've put so much effort into that through the year. Our specials are incredibly special. And uh, so of course, our children once a week go to music, twice a week go to physical education, once a week go to art and innovation lab, and our fourth graders, if they choose to, take part in band with Mrs. Bennett. Um, you can see up in the left corner there, we have children in art class. Below, Mrs. Bennett's working with a student with the first band lesson for that student, I believe. Top right is our new music teacher, Mr. Durland. Um, the creativity in this room and the student engagement is astounding and we're really excited to see what Mr. Durland brings. He's already playing the ukulele throughout the school <laughs> and he performed for our staff the first day. Um, I actually asked him if he wanted to. He said yes. I said great, he did it and it was phenomenal. Uh, and of course, phys ed keeps our kids healthy and moving and they've been working with, what's it called? The most impossible shot? Yeah, it's hard to make, but it's based on kindness and character education. So um, we've got great things happening. Innovation Lab is a relatively new special, although I've been, I think we've got, is this your fifth year? Four? Okay, well Mrs. Bruno, who used to teach in the general ed classroom, um, has taken the opportunity, again, to um, create a special that combines all of the STEAM um, words and science, technology, uh, whoa, engineering, art, mathematics. And so um, Mrs. Bruno's phenomenal. She basically took this opportunity and developed a program that is so innovative, so creative, and so engaging. And the children do love to go to Innovation Lab. They have to walk outside to get there because it's in the fancy modular building that was updated. And I don't think she ever wants to leave that place. She loves it. And I am actually going to ask Jen Bruno to come share with us because I don't know if the board has heard what really goes on in this class, K through four. This is a picture of the beautiful room where Jen teaches every day. A lot goes on in that room. I promise not to take up too much time, but I do have to tell you, I struggled with figuring out what I wanted to show here tonight because I could probably talk for hours upon hours of what <laughs> we do in there. It is probably the most fun I've ever had in my life, and I loved being a classroom teacher. Like, I loved it, loved it, loved it with a passion, but this is just the most amazing place that I've ever been. And it's not because I got to write the curriculum or anything, the kids make it even better. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of the things that we get to do and um, experience and expose the students to um, while in Innovation Lab. Um, and then if you have any further questions or if ever you wanna pop in and check it out and have some fun, you are more than welcome to come in because it is really a special place. Um, so the 
three things that we always review every time we come into Innovation Lab is to be creative, be brave, and be collaborative. And when I talk about being brave, I talk about knowing that failure is okay. And I think that's really important for the students to understand. And even when you uh, do something the first time and it, you get it right or it works out, what can you do to even make it better? Can you make a change? What would you change? Things like that. So really just getting them to kind of explore those thoughts. So most lessons, activities, challenges that we do are based around these four C's of communication, creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration. The next uh, several slides that I'll show you um, are just some samples of some of the things that we get to do while we're in Innovation Lab um, with our youngest kindergarten students all the way through our fourth graders. And I have to tell you that some of the younger students will always say, you know, when do we get to do that? And I'm like, well, that's a fourth grade challenge, so you've got to wait. So every year, one more year, then we're there. I'm like, I know, you're getting there. So uh, it's very exciting. So a lot of the times when we have, um, if, we, if we meet our goal for the day and we have a good 10 minutes left over, I give them a little time to explore and create. They also get to earn, with our tiger paws, some explore and create days. These are just some of the things that the students have come up with, with me just putting out supplies and randomly saying, go, explore and create. What can you do? What do you want to do? So just some of these little things are amazing. I actually want to keep some of them. Um, like that little guy on the little egg right there. Um, <laughs> even these, these were just students that said, oh, I want to build something. I'm not really quite sure what it's going to turn into, but I'm going to start, and then more kids would come over and it would turn into a group thing. Um, and it's really interesting to see and hear their thoughts with each other. No, no, that's not going to work. Oh, look, it's going to collapse. What are we going to do? No, let's make the base bigger. You know, and then I'll say, well, what's that word again for base? Oh, foundation. Yeah, yeah, foundation. You know, so trying to work in those vocabulary words. Um, we do, um, I do a lot of math connections here. We do a lot of digital designs, as you can see. This was based off of some symmetry lessons. Um, I talk about it as being identical in kindergarten, and then from first grade on, we talk about symmetry. We get into rotational symmetry in fourth grade, reflectional symmetry in second and third grade, and these are just some of the designs that the kids have come up with. The marble run might be the most favorite thing for almost all <laughs> students. And um, it's really interesting. The picture that you see on the left there with those four friends, that was a picture last year. They were in kindergarten. They're in first grade this year. By the end of the school year, they were so proud that they got every single, just about every single marble run piece connected, and their marble went through every track. It took a lot of problem solving, a lot of failure, and they were finally so excited. They're like, yeah, so we had to take a picture. But that's one of the things that no matter what grade level they're in, they are all super excited about that. And I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of hard. I've done the marble <laughs> run before, and I'm really good at finding the base and getting a couple of things mm -hmm. together, but then other times I'm like, I need you guys to come over here and show me this, because you can't get it to go through every track sometimes. It's very, very tricky. So a lot of the times in the beginning of the school year, we'll talk about the dot, because there is a very, um, a strong message in there about being creative and believing in yourself. So um, I do a different activity with every grade level, and in third grade, I get to expose them to augmented reality, um, which is pretty exciting. They have no clue what is is at first until I show them a picture of Pokemon Go, and then they freak out and they think, oh my gosh, we're going to play Pokemon Go? No, that's not how it works. But we do get to use a Quiver app, which is a free app. Most of the things that I try to do in Innovation Lab, I try to use the free version so that they can go home and get it if their grown-up allows them to. Um, and I think that people appreciate that because free is always great. Um, we do a lot of animation. So starting with our youngest students, we um, on the iPad, there is a free app that is called Toy Theater, and there is Animation Station. And then in second grade, we get to Chatter Picks. By the time they get to second and third grade, we're making stop motion videos and Google Slides. And then I have a new one, that Flip NM. I took a summer class. Thank you, by the way, for approving all of that. Um, and so I'm going to try that. We're creating digital flipbooks this year with fourth grade on the computer, on their Chromebook. So that's very exciting. So. Coding is a huge unit that we do, and this is like the big one that everybody always waits for. So we do start off with very basic uh, directional coding, all block coding. This year, I'm hoping to get our fourth graders to use a little bit of um, written code um, through CodeMonkey and another site. They have some different written code. It's not necessarily JavaScript. They call it CoffeeScript, so it's a little <laughs> less based. I know, it's very funny. Um, so I'm hoping to use that with them just to get them to that further level. But basically, we go over sequencing, loops, conditions, all of that stuff that I had no idea existed before I started to do this. I was on YouTube 
what do I do? What is this? Reaching out to uh, Mr. Fiore at the high school, like, I need you to help me here. I have no idea what's happening, but this is amazing and it looks fun. So we do BBOTS, and with the BBOTS, I'm able to work in math standards, reading, writing, things like that. Um, these are some of our other bots that we've used. On the right side, you'll see Primo. <coughs> He's our basic coding bot for kindergarten. That's what we start with because he has a control panel and buttons that he uses. And these other ones, we have Artie the Art Bot. We have Huey, who's new, that little guy in the middle at the bottom. And then our mouse bot, Colby, uh, where the kids get to make up their own design of their board and then try to get the mouse through wherever, whatever they have built and designed. These are just some other things as well. We do Scratch Junior. Um, it's really interesting to see them try to debug their code because that's where they have to find their own mistake and then try to fix it, um, which is really nice. And, I, and there's kindergartners that are debugging even though they don't know that that's what they're doing. And so you're gonna become a computer programmer, you're well on your way. This is the big one that everybody wants to get to. So in fourth grade, we code drones. <laughs> We go into the auditorium. I take a whole class of fourth graders. I know, it's a little insane if you think about it, but it has been utterly amazing. The kids are safe. They have to be approved and get their pilot's license. They have a flight attendant who makes sure that they're, they're flying, their flight area is clear, and they have to use the block coding in order to get their drones to fly. Um, so that's one thing that our fourth graders really look forward to, and that's the one that everybody wants to get to. Um, we go over a little bit of binary code, just learning different types of coding language, and then I try to differentiate in terms of what are the kids going to do. So whatever we're doing, it is completely hands-on. It's as much hands-on as possible, as much creativity as possible. And um, here are just some more, couple quick things. Engineering design process is something we go through a lot, where they have to plan something first and then try to build it. These are just a couple quick examples. Collaboration challenges are huge. Um, they're not easy. They have to learn compromise. They have to learn communication. Um, but it is really cool to see them kind of achieve or not achieve their goal. And then what are they going to do? I do ask them to reflect at the end of classes. What could we have done differently? What would you want differently? Would you want more supplies, less supplies, things like that? Another one of the big projects is our balloons over Broadway. So we learn about Tony, Tony Sarg, not Tony Stark. All the kids think I say that at first. I'm like, no, no, it's not Iron Man. No, Iron Man. He is the puppeteer from the original Macy's Day Parade. Mm -hmm. And then they get to design and build their own balloon. And then we have a little parade of our own at the elementary school for all the other kids to see. So that's really exciting. We do a big maze unit from kindergarten all the way to fourth grade. In the younger grades, they start to explore. They have to draw a plan, try to you know get their little hex bug through it or whatever it is, marble run. By the time they leave in fourth grade, um, they get to build and design their own marble maze that they get to take home with them. And they have to do all of it, the measurements, the angles, things like that. This was just a Somebody gave me these fun biodegradable packing peanuts and I didn't know what to do with them, so we <laughs> made a creation station out of them and these are just some things that the students came up with. We talked about what biodegradable means. We looked at that versus a piece of styrofoam and how it actually breaks down in water and then the kids were able to create things and take them home. Not quite sure if the parents love that part, but I know they do and I do and they're so proud of their work. And then the last one, um, well, there's one more after this, but this is one that I'm actually super thankful for um, Dr. Michelle Lucier and our Putnam Valley Education Foundation. Uh, Dr. Lucier is an OT specialist. She came to me a few years ago and had said, you know, I have this idea for this project. Would you be willing to hear it? And uh, of course, let's go, like, let's do it, whatever. I'm, I'm up for anything. So our fourth graders every year get to work on a collaborative project where they create their own visual perceptual I spy posters that get hung up around the school. So we teach the fourth graders about visual perception. Then they have to do this whole plan. They come up with a theme and then they design them and throughout the school year, we hang them up, and that is what a lot of our, our OTs use for our students to practice their visual perceptual skills. So that's really nice. So huge <coughs> shout out to the Education Foundation and Dr. Lucier for bringing this up because it's one of the favorite projects and the kids always look forward to it. Oh yeah, I forgot about this one. This one's a fun one too. <laughs> I promise I'm almost done. So we talk about forces in flight. 
we make our own air-powered rockets and we actually get to fly them. In the younger grades, we make hoop gliders, we talk about flight, all of the different forces that come into play, and then that actually also leads us to our drone flying because all the forces of flight are pretty much all the same with any vehicle that, that uh, flies. We do a little bubble exploration. They have to build their own bubble wand before they can do it. We mix our own bubbles. Um, and then it's interesting because then they always come up with something like the hands are like, did you know I can make a bubble in my hand? You know, so they get very excited about it. And then finally, one last thing is just our electrical unit. Um, we have snap circuits that we start working with. We learn about insulators and conductors and through there, we then get to work with our Makey Makey, which is electrical circuits and conductors working together to control some sort of electric device or game that they get to play. So this is actually just a short, I know I've talked for very long, but um, it's just a very short snippet of what we get to do in Innovation Lab. It is, like I said, the most fun I've ever had. Um, you guys like it, right? <laughs> um, so thank you for the opportunity to do it because it is just, it is unbelievable. The kids love it, I love it, and you know, I couldn't be more thankful, so appreciate Dr. it. Dr. Podesta, what's the possibility of maybe organizing a day trip? I, I, I would love to see I, this class in action. This God. fascinates the heck out of me. If, if, you, if there's a certain it, grade level awesome. you want to see, I can send you the schedule of the grade. We can clear it with administration, and yeah. you're welcome to come I, anytime. I would love to visit. We love I, I mean visitors. That. I'm sure other board members yeah, would you. love that. If, if there's something specific that you want to see, like in terms of one of these, you're like, oh, I'd really like to see that. I can let I, you know I when I'm doing it. it. it but just, if not, just whenever. You Come have a new in. student. There you go. It's going to be sitting we in your class. We have an Innovation Lab Adult Day, too. Yeah. I mean, visit yes. with the kids, but we should set up stations for you guys to explore. Right? <laughs> I, I think this Don't is Don't you fantastic. want to go back to the elementary I'm, school now? I'm really impressed. <laughs> So yeah. it's, it's so much fun. So please come. Please. You are more than welcome. I, I Anytime. Would, send an I email. We'll get it set up. Want, want to do so, that. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. That deserves a round of applause. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it does not go unnoticed the amount of planning and preparation that is yeah. going into each and every lesson. Uh, Jen teaches gen ed students, special ed students. She teaches K through four. She's teaching all day, every day. She happens to coach for our district. She works with Liz Bross with the Science Maker Fair. I don't think she sleeps much, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really something. So a couple of years ago, <clears throat> Dr. Podesta and I sat down to talk about what the old technology elective was going to be. And um, we started talking about, like, this is the class I dreamed I could teach, right? And just be as creative and authentic and all of those things as possible. And uh, Margaret and I started brainstorming, what are, what are the things that we could, like, we need a teacher. Like, who, who would take this under their <laughs> wing and make this, this grand um, <clears throat> vision a reality and we could not have done a better job of no. I think maybe there was a tap on the shoulder like hey you're considered teaching this class I'm just entirely impressed by how far you have taken yes. what was a vision four years ago and put it into reality for the last four years and I'm in awe and seeing all the things that you've been able to do so yeah. Like Sam, I'll be sure to be stopping out there more often yeah. too. The it fourth grade teachers will enjoy the break from their classrooms where I hide, so <laughs> I'll start going out to the innovation lab. But I don't know if you could see, but the first graders who are remaining, she would say certain words and their faces would light up because they love doing it so much and they're only in first grade, but I think you just said makey makey or something and all of a sudden the eyes went whoo! Like <laughs> well, I say this so. way, have you ever, um, if you ever retire or leave here, they might be looking for a new superintendent. Because uh, I'm going to apply for your job. Yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't want it? So thank you so much, Mrs. Bruno. Thank you. All right. And just to finish up our presentation, I just want to highlight the amount of teamwork and the collaboration and the faculty support that takes place in our school on a daily basis. We have very strong grade level teams and departments and that really makes a school. We learn best from each other. It's a place of learning and growth. We share our worries and our struggles 
and there are some, and then we continue to move forward. So of course we have our grade level coordinator team, our team leaders who help with communication, our monthly professional development hours, our RTI team, data teams that take place, we meet quarterly. We have our safety, our BERT team, our building steering committee, and we work closely with the Putnam Valley Education Foundation and our amazing PTA. Our professional development is ongoing, whether it's from in-house or with outside consultants. This happens to be Mr. David Marsh from the Wilson Company, who came in to help our teachers and has been in with foundations. He is an amazing consultant as well, and our teachers just want more. They're like, just bring him back, bring him back. We have Teresa Bork, who helps with foundations, and as I said, Carrie Burdett. We really have strong teacher leaders in the building, and that social capital makes a huge difference. We have an amazing faculty, and I can't say enough about them. I've been there, this is my 12th year now. We have quite a learning culture, a very strong team effort, um, a supportive learning community, teacher leaders who continue to rise to the top, turnkey trainers we learn from each other, and the growth mindset. I want to say that last, um, our field day, Mrs. Orgemma, our PE teacher, said, hey, I saw something, I want to see if we can try it, and so it was, you know, big costumes and lots of effort and staff participation. And I was thinking, oh, it might be hot, it's the end of the year, it might feel a little crazy. No, wait till you see how many people participated and what this looked like. <laughs> Epic. <laughs> Barney's my favorite. It was a beautiful moment. I mean, why not show the children how much fun we can have each and every day? And I thank the teachers for just jumping in and saying, okay, if you can watch my class, I'll be in. And all of a sudden, all these costumes appeared. And I just, I just love the place. I really do. And then I'm... Okay. Good time with I love the upside down, man. You're so cool. I did. <laughs> I did nearly get trampled by Mr. Potato Head earlier in that. You should just watch that. Yeah. I know, but I was watching it, filming it, and as I was filming, Mr. Potato Head run across the field. I did not realize that Mr. Potato Head did not see me, and I have on video me essentially diving out of the way as Mr. Potato Head rushes by. Yeah. Mr. Potato Head. Thorough so. investigation has determined who Mr. Potato Head was. And totally unaware of my presence in, in my fault for being in their line of running. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. Anyway, I just want to thank the Board of Education, our administrative team, for all of your support. When we come up with new ideas, really, we do get the support and we feel the support. Um, our curriculum is strong, and when we want to try something new in a curriculum, the answer is usually, let's give it a try, let's see how we do. And so we appreciate that because our teachers benefit and our students definitely do. So thank you, let's have a great year. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions at all? Just Any great questions? job. Yeah. Great, great job. Thank you. Our kids are so blessed that they get to go to your school. They are. Thank they you are. for all the work that you do. Because all of that, I just have to say this because it needs to be said, all of that is orchestrated by leaders who really care, who balance all of those things in the air at one time, see the whole picture, get called to classrooms, have to meet with parents, and yet still be able to provide that to our kids every single day. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I do want to recognize that Putnam Valley Elementary School might be the happiest place on there. Um, it's, it's really the, the highlight of my day every day is going in there and just seeing the smiling faces of kids and teachers and the willingness to do whatever it takes to make uh, the experience of the students that we are here to serve uh, the best it could possibly be. So uh, this feels very much almost like an end of year presentation, not, a, not we've been in school for a couple of weeks presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how much more is accomplished throughout the school year. But I do want to recognize, obviously, our teachers and our yes, students yes. and our building Absolutely. administrators for a fantastic uh, overview of some, and I'll say some, of the very amazing things going on there in Putnam Valley Elementary School. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, teachers, yes. for staying with us tonight. Um, and when I, so I, I failed to introduce um, Phil Anabi. He's a new student rep. 
Yeah. Um, he's sitting with Aiden down here. Um, and, you know, we're going to call on you guys um, throughout the year. And I will say that we are so proud of the things that are going on in the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and you got, but you started at the elementary school. You know, that was your beginning. Um, and the work that they did with you and the kind of support that you got in the beginning is what has allowed you to be who you are today. So, you know, it's a, it's a process and it's nice to be able to see the whole process. Um, now we're all out of order, so <laughs> should we go back to the consent agenda? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Start at the beginning. Yeah. Huh? All right. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve the consent agenda items two through eight as presented to the board at this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? The agenda items tonight include approval of the previous meeting minutes, updated 2024-25 substitute listing, approval of CSE, CPSE placement, some additional work hours for various staff members, amend the appointment of a teacher to change a probationary period dates, approval of a homebound instructor for a classified student awaiting placement, and approved budget transfers for the period July 1st through September 24th. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The resolutions pass. Okay, let's see. Now the presentations. Um, we just did the elementary report. So we're going to have the first reading of the policy series 700, 7,000, excuse me, and 8,000. The 7,000s are facility goals and planning and the 8,000s are services in support of educational programs like services like safety, maintenance, transportation, food, insurance, and office. So did you guys, Sam, you and Crystal, have you yep. looked through these? <coughs> Any changes, anything we, specific that you can think of that? We went through the, the 7,000, which is the, the maintenance, uh, you know, the, the service building and grounds, and uh, David will be looking at that if he hasn't already done that. So that, that's all set to go. And the 8,000 was fairly extensive. That, mm -hmm. that, that took a little while, but uh, mm -hmm. we, we felt comfortable in um, making the, the various changes that we needed to. Nothing, so, like anything new and surprising? Just not not really, no. Uh, a lot on the COVID, you know, since oh, okay. we had the COVID, the, the procedures that you need to follow, that, that took some time, but uh, otherwise it was good. Okay, so, and where are we now? What what, are we 9,000, that's the next one, and we're going to be doing that Monday. on Monday mm -hmm. at 4.30. Okay. We'll meet. Okay. okay. Um, so l let's just hold the, the NISBA resolutions for a minute and go to the students while we're in that mode. <laughs> Skip the resolutions for a minute and ask for the student reference report. Uh, so we have a couple things coming up in the high school. Uh, on October 18th, we have color wars. All the grades have a uh, color, and they all what's your competitions. Color? Orange is the seniors, uh -huh. so everyone's excited for that. Uh, Underclassmen picture day is this upcoming Monday, September 30th. Uh, various colleges are coming and visiting in the guidance office for students to meet with them and discuss with the admissions officers. And the National Honor Society is sponsoring a blood drive. That'll be Thursday, October 10th. Uh, we're looking for as many people to donate as, as we can. Uh, please note that community members are only allowed to donate after 2.40 p.m. after school hours. Um, but please, as many community members that are willing to donate, please come out and try to donate. Thank you. Okay. Great job. Uh, all right. Uh, Dr. Luft, I'll let you go next. Sure. So I was also going to start by welcoming Phil and Abby uh, to the student board rep. Uh, as you'll see throughout the meetings, the year, uh, the board, the community, everyone is always very interested to hear what the students have to say. And as I shared with your uh, student colleagues, that once the students start talking, everybody else stops. And really sort of all eyes are on you because they really want to know what are your thoughts and and. and you're speaking on behalf of the students you represent. So congratulations and welcome. And I hope it's a very uh, meaningful experience for you. Certainly your voice will be heard and uh, listened to. 
So some of the big events that have happened since the last board meeting, our high school had its IB visitation for our evaluation for the diploma program. Uh, we were joined by Karina and Philip, uh, the two evaluators that uh, one came, actually both are Canadian. One is currently living in uh, the British Virgin Islands, the other one in uh, Vancouver. So very different climates they came from. They, just some of the summaries they had shared, they spent two full days here. They met with every group of constituents from students to parents, administrators, district office, uh, support staff, community members, anyone that is part of our school community had an opportunity to come in and have their voices be heard. Um, by the by the visitors they really were impressed in all and everything that Putnam Valley has been able to accomplish in five years and I know in several times they had said this is, is a every five-year process they said some districts take 10 15 20 years just to get to where we've gotten in a short period of time uh, regarding how robust, robust of a program we offer how we have IB for all uh, the number of students we have participating in various levels of IB courses both diploma candidates and those enrolling in SL and HL standalones uh, it was really a useful we're still awaiting the written report which I think was four to six weeks upon completion but they did hold the community meeting where they shared verbally what their findings were and uh, were very impressed in everything they saw so I do want to recognize and thank everyone who was part of that process, but a very special uh, thank you and recognition to Vindy Gregorio, our diploma program coordinator, and Matt Mello, our high school principal, who were really instrumental in making all everything possible. <clears throat> we hosted a facilities planning committee meeting. Uh, this group discussed the potential uh, project scope for uh, what's anticipated to be a project that'll go out to the community to vote later this winter. We discussed draft rendering, we reviewed and discussed draft renderings of the project work. We discussed potential timeline and information dissemination to the community. And in, in the near future, there'll be a board update uh, pending or the, the creation of updated public relations documents. I think most of our conversation focused on how do we get timely, accurate, information in the hands of everyone in our community so they can ultimately make an informed decision when it comes time to vote. Much of the project is infrastructure driven in terms of parking lots, geothermal wells at the elementary school, uh, retaining walls and things like that. Some maybe those aren't super exciting for some people, uh, but there are some uh, upgrades to our instructional spaces as well, including our elementary school library, our elementary school nurse's office, and uh, the common uh, all room in the middle school. So look forward to sharing some of those renderings and some of the discussions that the facilities planning committee had, um, ultimately deciding on a final timeline and then really beginning the, the public relations piece of it, making sure that the community has all of the information. We had, uh, I had a meeting with the Education Foundation leadership. For those who don't know, we have new uh, leaders of the Education Foundation. So. I met with uh, Brooke Donahue and Dr. Amin to go over some of their fundraising ideas, the grant funding priorities in terms of how the types of grants they're looking to fund, and really a lot of conversation regarding participation and communication, both to participate in the fundraising events as well as uh, teachers taking the opportunity to write grants to access those funds that are made available. So a huge compliment to them. They have a great plan. We're looking forward to working closely with them. I had the opportunity to meet with two representatives from Camp Combe. Uh, Camp Combe is run by the YMCA of Westchester. And two of the things that really stood out to me, which I've already shared with the high school leadership as well as our student government, is they offer uh, a free, located in Putnam Valley. I told her those were two very important words. Free <laughs> in Putnam Valley. Uh, many of the opportunities our students have to participate in free or paid activities many times are hosted in Carmel, right. Rooster, not easily accessible for Putnam Valley students, uh, hosted at Camp Combe and free. So uh, both a team leaders group as well as a youth and government group. So those are two groups made available free of charge for all students located in Putnam Valley. So. I know that uh, they're working with Mr. Scampoli to find an opportunity to come speak with all the members of the student government, and my hope is that's really an opportunity for them to, uh, students to learn more about these groups, and hopefully some students uh, decide to join. Our middle school students have uh, been going from smaller groups, visiting TOEC, it's kind of outdoor education center. Our buildings, middle school and high school, have hosted back to school nights. Elementary school was earlier in the year. I attended a section one executive committee meeting 
I attended the NISCUS conference. My work there really focused on finding connections to our opportunity goal for the upcoming year. Uh, I saw some really interesting stuff regarding regional curriculum development project focused on the power of words and hate speech, mm -hmm. uh, which is something we continue to unfortunately experience within our schools. Uh, communication and community feedback on capital projects, as well as community engagement and feedback in general. So those are some of the big topic items. And I know an upcoming event that I'll share a little bit about, the district is in short order releasing information regarding our upcoming first responder appreciation events. So please be up on the lookout for those. As a reminder, for the football game, which I believe is scheduled on November 1st, uh, we encourage all volunteers and paid first responders to simply show up for the beginning of the game. They follow the color guard down the driveway, stand on the field to be quickly recognized, national anthem, and then they're free to stay for the game or go on their way. I know there are hundreds upon hundreds and probably thousands of first responders that live, work, and serve the Putnam Valley community. I am uh, eagerly awaiting the year where we fill the turf. Um, I know some years I'm grabbing arms and pulling them out of the bleachers <laughs> to stand because nobody wants to be the person on the field. But I know we're a community full of first responders and I would really love for there to be a turnout that shows the sheer number of those individuals we have in our community. It takes about 15 minutes, if that, and they're free to go on their way or stay to enjoy the game. So that's happening as well as our elementary schools having their typical uh, first responder reading. So first responders can sign up, uh, pick a book about their profession and go in and read to uh, elementary school students. It's always very cute. And the middle school, high school event, we're going to shift a little bit. In the past couple of years, we've done apparatus. So we've invited in police agencies, ambulance, fire from all over the region to come and show off some of their gear. The reality is that some students have now seen that for the last three years. <laughs> so we're really shifting a focus. And it's, a, it's upon conversation with many of these organizations, every volunteerism in general is struggling, and all of these organizations yeah. are struggling to find interested individuals willing to volunteer their time. The other piece is they all have some sense of youth core. So whether younger students who may not be able to fully volunteer can start to, vo start to learn more about what it would be to volunteer. So the Ambulance Corps is a youth corps, the Fire Department is a youth corps, the Sheriff's yeah. Office has a youth corps. So our shift this year, our focus this year, is going to shift towards providing those organizations an opportunity to speak directly to our students, specifically middle school students. Right? We want to start to gain that interest and that excitement in the middle school years so when they reach high school and they can start to join the youth corps, they can do so. And then when they're of the appropriate age, then hopefully they can become a full um, volunteer or move into a career as a professional uh, first responder. So those are some of the things to look forward to. Obviously, more information about that. Those other events are scheduled for the last week in October. The culminating event will be the football game November 1st. Thank you. Excellent. Wow. OK, so we'll back up a little and go back to the NISBA um, resolutions. Um, Maureen was at a meeting of district clerks Right, Maureen? Yes. And, and they talked about most of the districts don't even go through this. They just let board members call whoever the representative, happens to be me this time, um, and give their opinion. I, I think it's helpful sometimes to hear the discussion with some of the things. You guys have one, right? It's that green paper here? Or black? Yeah. Okay. I just want to be sure they know what we're talking about. So there are a couple things. I have Sam mentioned his the ones that he supported um, last time. Number four, which Sam said he supported, we had a long discussion at the at the resolutions committee about whether to support this or not. And Nisba, I mean um, Westput is not did not ever reach a decision. So uh, uh, since I have to vote for us, I'd like to know what you think. Um, basically. They felt the West Putt felt that it it might encourage teachers to to go into teaching if you change tiers five and six um, tiers five and uh, but some districts felt that it wouldn't or that the money could be used in a better way or that we don't have any idea how the retirement system works and we just want to stay out of it so. 
I, I need to know what. I, I feel strongly that at least the state should examine the current retirement systems. Uh, tier five and tier six are so inequitable to our, our new uh, instructors who, who entered the field, who have entered the field the past few years. Uh, there's such a, a, a discrepancy between those who have been tier one through four and then five and six. It's like a whole different hybrid creature. I, it, and I really believe that one of the reasons we lack new instructors and why there's going to be such a potential shortage of instructors is that for myself, I, I, I can speak, and for many others who entered the field, we love working with kids and educating them, but also the fact that while you're doing that, you're building a retirement nest egg for, for your, your family. And that's really important for many, many individuals, especially in the economic times we're going through. At least support it so that the state can look at maybe doing something. We spend so much money in the state of New York on things that just blow my mind, and I'm not gonna get into it because some of it's political, that we could divert some of that money to the just making tier five and tier six a little bit better, a little bit more equitable to uh, tier four. They need that conversation, and unless our organization supports looking at this and changing this, the state is never going to do anything. They're going to just say, well, it is what it is. We, we're not hearing a lot of buzz, so we'll, we'll just let it be. And I think that's a mistake because we're going to lose, as we all know, a, an ocean full of instructors within the next five years, even affecting our building here at the high school, the middle school. It, it's coming, and unless we have capable individuals who want to enter this profession knowing that uh, it's not only a great and rewarding profession but also that they're able to establish some type of retirement system that will help them when they do retire uh, we're going to be caught short so I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of this and I, I think we should support it just to get the state aware that there's concern okay. I wholeheartedly agree with you I don't know that um, Changing it to be more equitable would produce more teachers because the fact of the matter is when you're a new teacher, you're not really thinking about retirement unless that has been the conversation in your home for a long time. That being said, it should be changed because teachers deserve it. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. I, I like that's kind of my stance on it is uh, honoring the, the hard work that goes into literally raising the next generation yeah of people who will lead us and pave the path for what will happen in the future. So I wholeheartedly support the conversation of it. I think that um, the teacher shortage has a lot of pieces to it, one of which being, um, I know what the research says. The research says that the workload is just not manageable, yeah. uh, especially after COVID. And so, you know, this may be a factor if the conversation is great enough where it might be in families of teachers, right? So that's where this conversation really comes in, is if you have generational families of teachers that are now protecting their children from going into the teaching profession because they understand the implications of what will happen to them in retirement, where they're coaching them to not go that way, that's where I would see this really having yeah. an effect. Um, but I do think that we should support um, making it a, a better turnout at the end for them okay. that they might not even be thinking about right now. Yeah. I also support it. Huh? I also support it. Okay. Um, mostly for those, for many of the reasons. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly because I think our teachers deserve it. That's right. Okay. That makes it easier for me. Jeremy? Well, not that I get a vote, but I do want to say something on this topic. Um, I, I understand probably their hesitation to support it is financial. Right? Financial, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. I'm not well, as gung-ho, but I, I right. do support it. Whatever, whatever contributions to the pension system are not kicked in by the employees, they're picked up by the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. That's just okay. how the system right. works, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and obviously there's both sides of that argument. I, I would fall under the deserve it as well side. But I think there's really a common sense solution that benefits both. I think if they were to lower the retirement age back to 55, there you go. 
just that alone would that be alone huge. is because the reality is districts are forced to now carry right districts offer retirement incentives to individuals all the time mm -hmm. because you're at the, your highest possible salary when you reach that age right. Right. by extending the retirement age from seven years more seven yeah. years more that's seven additional years you're at carrying your salary. absolute highest salaries plus now you have to negotiate additional steps and additional right. monies to compensate those teachers who are teaching for an additional seven years i think that is maybe a great starting point that mm -hmm. both benefits the schools in terms of payroll savings, benefits the employees of not being held there for so long without necessarily penalizing the retirement system, uh, who would be forced to pay them out based upon higher salaries mm -hmm. if they stay seven additional years right. and earn more money. That's true. So, mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's always been my sort of common sense starting point for that conversation. They could certainly chip away at some of the other things, but. That for that alone, which would benefit the school and the employee, seems like a win-win to me, and that's something that I, I would hope the state would come around to supporting. Well, they need to start the conversation, and, and I don't believe the state has done that uh, since they instituted Tier 5 and Tier 6. It, it, there's right. been no conversation, right. and that's why I think it, okay. it, it might be good for them to hear that. The other one that, that West Putt um, <coughs> opposed was number 15. Um, the I proposal to was to initiate to advocate for the swims initiative to be extended and expanded to include additional enhanced and targeted state funding specifically dedicated to constructing pools in k-12 schools and for the <laughs> don't want to tell your facilities committee this. No. <laughs> don't, right. don't don't take this or back the to the state payers. wants to pay 100 percent i'll build the pool so they're going you know, to cover the cost of it. The rationale is there's so many students who don't know how to swim That's true. and who die yep. by drowning. Right. But how, how much can the schools bear? And, you know, and the state is not going to give you 100%. Plus no, your no. insurance they should give and... Tax credit for swim lessons. Huh? You should give parents a tax credit for swim lessons, and that might take care of that. Okay, but it's okay to oppose this. I definitely I, I would. That. I would. Huh? Yep, definitely yeah. oppose Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That'd be too much for the taxpayers to take on. Yeah. Okay. So We're, no pool. Huh? No so pool. I'm very sad about that. I love. Just, I love. No, pools, no. I, I, where would you put it? Uh, the well, out here where the water flows down. <laughs> Uh, Phil told me he joined the board as a student rep just to advocate for a swimming pool <laughs> on the roof. Did we just break your heart? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, won't, we won't be here anyways to see it. Yeah. That's true. That's right. It'll be a long but you'll water. come back. <laughs> you didn't come back and swim at Christmas time. I mean, there was talk of a pool back in uh, 98, oh, 99 yeah. when they, uh, you know, presented the, the building, place, right? the high school. But yeah. I, I, the expense a lot of work. and the insurance. And the maintenance. Yeah, and maintenance. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It is. Pools were much cheaper back then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now forget it. Yeah. Um, did anybody have any other particular um, of these resolutions that they either thought we should oppose or? I have one that I super support. I don't know if okay. you can. Um, I support that uh, we, the school districts, what provide number an opt out. Oh, number 16, that they provide the opt out yeah, for transportation. I agree I with that. I am about that. That would be an incredible way to save resources. And You're not kidding. Take there's some so money many parents. Yeah, but here's the thing somebody opts out. And time. So there's not a seat on that bus, <laughs> right. and then there's an emergency or something else, and the parents can't, and then the kid doesn't have a way to get to school. I'm, I, I'm don't. I, I'm a little nervous about. Keep you know, two extra seats on the bus. Huh? Keep two extra seats on the bus for emergencies. All right. I don't know. I, mean, I will uh, support it, but. You think that I, I do think, I think that it's fiscally good. it's worth it. Yeah. Like, I do. When Absolutely. you think about fiscally. the, yeah. especially in our district where they drive um, their kids most people drive their kids. I mean, I think a lot of people drive their kids here because um, I see that school. parking lot in the morning and in the afternoon. <laughs> well, we're trying to, to discourage that. You know, um, of course, we, we have the luxury of busing, but if it's not being utilized and we're paying for empty seats on the bus, that doesn't necessarily make a difference. And this would be my plug. Let's take that money and get a monitor on the bus <laughs> so that our kids can be safe. Yep. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I just think that the, the pros of that outweigh the cons and that if there is an emergency, maybe there is a small van that is then just allocated for emergencies that could potentially 
take students to where they need to go, you know. How do you, are our buses, are a lot of our buses empty? Are they full? Our bus they? is very empty, the one that passes by our house. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, because they're, they're I drive my kids to school and would opt out and save the taxpayers money. <laughs> it's very empty. So my kids I, I think it sounds <laughs> fancier than it is, right? School districts actually have the right to base their transportation on ridership. We're, we're, we don't have an obligation to provide a seat for mm -hmm. every student on that bus, right? We have the ability to audit a uh, number of students that are physically riding the bus each day and base our transportation on that. So it's, it's not that it doesn't exist, but the argument that always comes up is what happens when you have an early dismissal, right? Well, 100 kids might be dropped off at the elementary school in the morning by their parents, if we decide at 10.30 to dismiss at 11 because a pipe broke, those 100 parents aren't coming back. So now the question is, what do you, what do, you do with 100 kids if you who don't bus. have seats on yeah. buses? I think ma there's maybe more practicality to it in the secondary schools. We have fewer yes. buses. Um, we have seniors that are riding their buses. But again, we have that ability now. We could. Maybe a, a broader board conversation is, do we want to reduce buses based upon ridership at the secondary level and then decide how to handle those emergency situations? Yeah. Right. We have it in our contract. We can ask our buses, our bus drivers to count students and report those numbers on a daily basis. So we would have um, a sort of a concrete ridership number. Hmm. But it varies by season, number of students participating in sports, clubs that are running. That, that's part of the complicating factor. Our stance in Ponte Valley has always sort of been, we need a seat for a student in case there's an emergency. Right. So we essentially allocate a seat for everyone who could be getting on that bus. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not necessarily what the law is, right? We have the ability to base transportation on actual ridership. We just have to c be able to handle the emergency Repercussion dismissal right. issues. I and it's not always, right a snowstorm's coming and people could plan right. for it, right? It could right. be many other things. It could be evacuating. We had a pipe building. break like what, two, a year ago, two mm -hmm. years ago. I, I think it's worth exploring because if it's a significant amount of money, uh, which it probably would be, um, and we're able to come up with a contingency plan that makes sense, that would kind of in a way really need to be, think. I, I mean, I like to do drills, like, you know, try it and see if it actually works on, you know, what on paper works in, in real life. Um, but I, I think it's worth exploring. I do. Right, Agreed. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. All right. So we're so being that responsible could, with our funding. I will vote yeah, in absolutely. support, but yeah. we will we'll see what happens ha with have, it. but we will also, they can, this is just that what they're going to advocate for, exactly. it, you know, but we can work our own whatever yeah. we need to do. Um, okay, so that so then let's go down to new business. Did we, we did everything right, first reading of the policy, student representative, yep, okay. New business, uh, number one, please. Okay. Resolve to accept the fiscal year ending June 2024 external audit report as presented to the board at this meeting, including extra classroom activity funds completed by PFK O'Connor Davies, the independent auditors for the district, and the district response corrective action plan management letter. Attachments noted as document 74 slash 25 and are included with the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The resolution passes. <coughs> Number Two, please. Resolved on the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools to approve the first reading of Policy Series 7000, document number 70 slash 25, and Policy Series 8000, document number 71 slash 25, documents attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? Thank you both for all the work you've done and will continue to do. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, the resolution passes. Number three, please. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to accept the resignation of teaching assistant Lucas DeMay from the district as per document number 73 slash 25 attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
abstentions. The resolution passes. Number four, please. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to accept the resignation for the purpose of retirement of teacher Cheryl Kahn from the district effective June 30th, 2025 as per document 75 slash 25 attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? Yeah, uh, Cheryl will be missed. Yeah. Uh, you know, God bless. Great retirement. Enjoy. Yeah, I just wanted to commend for the many years of service she's provided yeah. to students in Putnam Valley, really across all three uh, buildings, buildings in a variety of capacities. Uh, she served sure. our students. I also want to commend her for giving almost a year's notice. Huh? She <laughs> almost gave a year's notice for her retirement. Yeah. Way to go. <laughs> Agreed. Extra point. Extra, Extra point. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The resolution passes. Okay, upcoming topics. So Sorry, I'm still researching my actual ridership determined. I want to make sure what I said was accurate. <laughs> it says actual ridership shall be determined by a school district based upon documented history and experience that yields a consistent pattern of eligible pupils not using district transportation. That's the existing law. That's why I'm confused as to what they're changing. But back to the topic at hand. Okay, maybe a pipe will, pipe will burst in the winter and we can see who takes the bus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our next <laughs> meeting is scheduled for, we don't want that. I want to know for the official record. Dan, write that down somewhere. We do not want to pipe the verse to test our emergency <laughs> dismissal. Um, October 17th is our next board meeting. It'll be our opening of schools presentation and, sorry, opening schools presentation for our middle school as well as an athletics update. Uh, Tuesday, October 29th is opening of schools for the high school. And November 14th will be our buildings, grounds, and technology updates. Okay, on that, on that topic. <laughs> the 14th is also the regional superintendent board dinner at Tilly Foster. It was so good last oh, year. it was so good, and I'm so mad. Is there I can't any go. way we could move the 14th? Could we think? Second. <laughs> no, that would be a no, huh? I, I will defer to, my, to the art district clerk. She said maybe the 12th. The 12th. the 12th is a half a day for the elementary school because they have parent conferences at night, but. I hope we don't pull any parents away from conferences to attend our board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, who's presenting that night, did you say? Building and grounds and technology? Wait, is, that, is that really a calendar conflict that's happening right now? I think he's being sarcastic. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. What's I'm ignoring him. Let's, let's backtrack here. What, this is why what? everything needs to be on the calendar. <laughs> the the, the, oh, it the, is right now on the fourth well, On Thursday, November 14th, the regional superintendent sponsor a oh, dinner. November. I want to go. November. I yeah. would like to go again. November 14th. It's okay. on the future of foundation aid. But we have um, a board of ed meeting then. I know. We I'm asking, We're trying to move it. I'm how, asking how if we, we can move well. it because it, this is a... A chance we went last year so crystal was there one jeremy was there it was jackie I'm jackie and i got lost going we found our way crystal but, i know people i could probably get your conference scheduled around that time <laughs> on the 12th of around our board meeting we're gonna figure it out, figure it out. <laughs> oh you have a parent conference that night yeah okay. probably but it's i not. have kids in all three schools so whichever one has a conference that night <laughs> It's a half it's day for school. the elementary school and with parent conferences at night. Oh, I can do my parent conference in the afternoon. Okay. We'll make it work. I will call Mrs. Okay, Lincoln. so if, do we have to The get, next meeting will be a doc calendar. Okay. We'll switch. I'll make sure there's nothing else. Okay. So we're moving the meeting? Is what, 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 what date are we, we looking at? We have to at? accept it. The, the 12th. Next. We're looking at Tuesday okay. instead of Thursday. Oh, to November 12th. Okay, perfect. Should I like my calendar? Well. Love that plan. You'll let <laughs> us know? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Monday is closed. School is closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tuesday's a half day for the elementary school, but everybody else is the same. Mm -hmm. So. And what is this regional thing? Dinner. No, no I, I know it's a dinner, but what? It's like board, the boards of education in the region come together. Is that it? It's boards all the education. local superintendents, assistant superintendents, board members mm -hmm. from the component districts in Westchester and Putnam. They do it at Tilly Foster Farm. Oh, um, Tilly Foster. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They yes. do it in Putnam. Good last year. But good it, topic last it's really too. and really interesting to talk to people from and listen to people from other mm -hmm. places in the in the area speaking of which the latest on board um 
newspaper for board members, um, the whole beginning article was about, I always say it wrong, I wrote it down, regionalization? Yep, regionalization, that was it. So, like, we, <laughs> we've attempted regionalization on our own, and this is a, a state initiative, but they're putting BOCES in charge, and like you all have to send in like all this paperwork, and then you I have think to it's meet. specific to the regionalization of BOCES, not of local school districts. But I thought BOCES had to meet. It says BOCES has to meet before November first with every superintendent of every district. So, my understanding is, and Jackie's my BOCES expert, so you can chime in. <laughs> my, my understanding is this is the regionalization is specific to regionalization of BOCES in terms of what services, what BOCES offer, are those services available to schools across the state or only regionally, is, should BOCES sort of specialize on different topics um, and make themselves available throughout the state. It's not consolidation of school districts, like we're not just gonna um, uh, take on Garrison to be part of the Putnam Valley Central School yeah, District. Yeah, but you talked a lot this. about, like, sharing one, of, one of the ideas. They want districts to, we're supposed to report. If a student this, wants, is interested in physics and we can't offer a physics class. Right. Yeah. Sharing them, of services. Right. So send that child to another district for one class? Like, that the whole thing just seems, I, I don't know. I, I, it's okay if they're sending their kids here for IB. <laughs> we'll, we'll take them. But we take them full time. We don't take them for one class. But could we? And I, is the question. In the old days, I, I, I remember <laughs> back when I was at the middle school, set up a camera, and another school district was providing, I forget, a, a higher level of Spanish or French. I forget what it was. And the kids in the classroom. Oh, virtually, my Yeah, virtually. That, that's what it was. Except that's it, actually it was a really tough. Good idea. And, well, the technology was yeah. kind of kind of weak at the time but but now we did it the then. sky's the limit I, that's how I read the article so I will simply state I have just as many questions <laughs> as you all do <laughs> I just wanted to clarify it's not I consolidation it. of, of district. school districts right, right. this is specific to consolidation of services or sharing of services yeah. right. among BOCES Got it. we have until November 1st to fill out a survey based upon the services we receive from our BOCES which is phenomenal. The state's going to consolidate all of that information and then do whatever it is they do to determine <laughs> what the both seats should offer what services. The superintendents on the, on the, at the West Put meeting last night said they got a lot of help from the RIC to fill out the paperwork. The RIC sent us a whole spreadsheet. with We have to enter all kinds of data points. And Lyric sent us essentially like a consolidated school report card with all those data points. I have that information. So it's more work for us. To it's it's always more work for us. But. We don't ever get out. <laughs> We're thankful that with Lyric my, provided with, the information so we don't have to look with, it all up. With, with so that's, our, that's a partnership with the local BOCES. They're, they're already hooking us up. Okay. All right. Well, just keep us in the loop. But technically, I volunteered Jackie that she could fill out the survey. So she was very excited about it. <laughs> Keep us in the loop, Jack. Gold star, Jack. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Public comment on any topic. Sir, please come to the microphone. Hello, I'm William Cron. I live on Sproutbrook Road. I have three children in the district, and my wife is uh, employed by the district as well. So normally I don't uh, comment on anything uh, relating to business uh, as my wife is on staff, and sometimes I feel like, although I'm a taxpayer, there could be conflicts of interest in some ways. But uh, I'm here commenting, um, and I just want to open up uh, the discussion, and hopefully it'll... Um, It'll uh, snowball into further discussions for future meetings about the threat that happened yesterday at the school. We had a credible threat, and uh, it seems like uh, a, a, a high school senior on social media made a threat on Snapchat uh, uh, containing words such as, I'll kill everyone, no one will be spared. Very important, uh, very big issue. The, uh, the students, I feel, that viewed this did their job, reported it. And our district, uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had a memo from our administrators addressing the issue. 
and uh, it's been 24 hours and nothing has occurred. Now I understand when it's a child and it's a it's youth and it's um, the child's uh, a minor uh, disclosure of certain things have to be protected. I understand that. So I figured instead of focusing on the person and the child, I want to see if we could disclose to the families of our district. I've spoken to 15 families in just in the last 24 hours. And uh, I plan on speaking to hundreds, uh, everyone, within the next couple of weeks. I want to uh, have clear disclosure on our uh, procedures when this happens. All right. Uh, the, the shooting in Appalachia, Georgia, eerily similar. A child uh, was a credible threat. Uh, FBI and uh, sheriffs uh, locally in Georgia, all right, investigated and chatted with the family, and uh, nothing occurred. That was May 2023. August 2024, this same individual, all right, uh, his family noted issues, spoke uh, to each other that he had homicidal and suicidal tendencies. And still, you know, when those things go up, people get NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's not possible. It's not my child. If this never happened, we can say, well, it's a fluke. It doesn't happen. All right? And I, again, not to focus on the child, but to focus on our procedures. I don't, it doesn't mean that uh, procedures weren't followed. I'm saying that as a citizen, I'm unable to clarify what the procedures are. I know uh, people I've spoken with in the psychiatric community licensed to practice in the state, whom I know personally, have said that Rockland County and the NYPD, when they are uh, addressed of a similar situation, a full forensic psychological evaluation is required when this threat level is reached in order for a child to be returned to school and for weapons to be returned to the home. The home of the student in question had uh, over a dozen weapons which were seized by law enforcement. Now that means it was credible enough that they did their job and seized them. Now when I have four people whom I care for right on this very lot, three students and a faculty member are all right here within a couple of acres, I feel that the public should have a clearer idea of the procedures and when weapons will be allowed back in this person's possible possession, uh, if full forensic psychological evaluations are conducted by a professional, and I don't mean to disparage uh, anyone who may have spoken to the child, but uh, when someone's at the highest level, I think someone beyond a, a, a local family counselor may have to be um, Consultant, and it doesn't mean that it wasn't. I'm just saying, as a citizen, it hasn't been clear in 24 hours now what's happened. So, if this person is returning to school tomorrow or in the next few days, the 15 families I've spoken with are not comfortable, they're uneasy because we don't know what's going on. And again, not to focus on the child specifically, more procedures, and that's really what the topic is. And uh, that's where I will leave it. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Sir, go ahead. Um, I was just, thank Mr. Cron. Uh, I'm used to seeing you sing at the microphone and not speak, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can certainly speak to the procedures. I mean, you're 100% correct. Legally, we are not allowed to talk about consequences for the student, but you shared way more information than I could ever share or validate. Um, and I won't ask where you got it from, but it's, I know it wasn't from the school. So, I get it, which is fine. Um, but you, I have different rules than you do in terms of what I can disclose and, and such. But I certainly can share what the process is. Mm -hmm. First, I want to commend our students. Right? We we preach to them all the time what it means to be an upstander. If you say if you see something, to say something. That happened within minutes of this post being made. Multiple students reached out to teachers. Teachers reached out, reached out to administrators. It really happened immediately in terms of identifying, um, finding the student, sitting the student down, and then what we do is we assemble what's called a threat assessment team. That threat assessment team is composed of clinicians, uh, it's composed of administrators, and it's composed of law enforcement. That team was immediately assembled and sat down and began to do their work. They follow a very formal mm -hmm. format, right? That's, that's been recommended in the FBI threat assessment program they go through. They ask questions, they write answers, and they determine whether or not that threat was credible. I do want to clarify that the threat was deemed not credible. I know we said a couple of times that it was, but it was determined that there was no credible threat through the threat assessment as well as communication with law enforcement. 
As this is happening, law enforcement is conducting their own investigation. We have our SRO and our threat assessment team. The sheriff's office sent investigators here. So they're running sort of a parallel investigation at the same time we are. Um, obviously, what they do through their investigation, I think you insinuated what the outcome of that was, uh, is their um, prerogative to do. I have no answer regarding how long that process, that's 100% in the sheriff's hands. They control that. Um, the, you referenced the red flag law. The petitioner, the, the owner has to petition the court to get their weapons back. That's the way the red flag law works. So they would need a judge's order to return those weapons to the household. Obviously, the school district has no say in whether or not that happens. Um, upon return to school, of which I will not specify when that happens, there is always sort of a wraparound approach to how we support the students. It's not just about the discipline, it's about how do we provide any student the mental health services they need. Um, what you're referencing is not my, I have zero ability to require a student to get a forensic uh, psychological evaluation, right? Is that right? Um, that would be considered a violation of their right to a free and appropriate public education. I just don't have that right. We could recommend it, uh, we can uh, help parents find it, but I can't exclude a student from school until they receive that, right? We can certainly help facilitate it, we could even pay for it, but it's not something that I can, I can't ban a student from school for that. You pointed out some very important facts regarding similarities and differences from the other shooting. Um, I think it's, immediate obvious, it's immediately obvious that what we did here in Putnam Valley immediately addressed many of those issues that were missed in other districts. How, how many times do we hear students knew this student was on a, a breaking point and nobody said anything, nobody spoke up, nobody told an adult, right? That's certainly not what happened here in Putnam Valley. How many times do we hear about the adult that was contacted dismissed it, right? They didn't take it seriously, they made a judgment call. That didn't happen here, right? We assembled an entire team and followed a very strict protocol regarding whether or not there was a threat assessment. How many times is it not escalated to law enforcement or does law enforcement not act? I think we've already shared that in this case, law enforcement was immediately contacted, immediately involved and followed through and acted. So um, we're certainly doing everything within our power, everything that our protocols are uh, to make sure that nothing as horrendous as happens in other schools will ever happen here. And we'll continue to do that. I'm really proud of our students, I'm proud of our staff, I'm proud of our administrators, and I'm proud of our uh, law enforcement for doing everything in their power to ensure that we had as much control over this situation as possible. And that's, um, and that's where we are now. So I, I thank you for breaking it up. It's an important subject. And I, believe me, when I write those memos, I just wish I could say so much more than I legally can. Um, but there are laws that I'm, I'm forced to abide by and, and that precludes much of that, the detailed information. And I certainly heard from other parents. They want details, they want to know what the consequences are, they want to know who the student's name is, and that's obviously information that I don't have the ability to share. So thank you for bringing it up. You I have a question, a follow-up. <clears throat> who determines whether or not it's a credible or uncredible threat? Well. And can you t like talk about the differences? So the threat assessment team has a structured document in which yeah. they follow. They go okay. through step by step through that. That team is meant to be sort of comprehensive administrators, law enforcement, and clinicians. So you're looking at people that are looking at the student, the actions from multiple lenses. Mm -hmm. It's not the administrator that's looking at the consequences. It's not just the clinician that's looking at how to support them. It's not just law enforcement who's looking at the legality of the law. It's a group of individuals they have to get together and they reach a consensus after filling out this form as to whether or not they deem the threat credible. When, whether we deem it credible or not does not preclude law enforcement from taking another approach. Okay. So that's happening simultaneously to our work. Law enforcement is also conducting their own uh, threat assessment, but they're doing it specifically through the lens of what the law is. Thank you for clarifying. You, you had mentioned the red flag. Um, you know, a uh, reference. Uh, did this individual have weapons, or you cannot say? I can't comment on that. That that would be something I would uh, I would find very troublesome if, indeed, th there was anything in that home at all that could cause 
you know. That would be under the, like, the that's threat the law assessment enforcement. team would look into those things, right? Well, no, I don't think so. so I, I think that's law enforcement. There is law enforcement as a component of the threat assessment team. So it is composed of law enforcement, at least one individual, a clinician, and an administrator who have been trained, all three, in the process of addressing a threat coming from a school because the nature of school-based threats are very different than other threats. It is a very detailed process. Having been through it myself, it is very detailed. It is very um, specific. And there is not much wiggle room because it's highly normed. And most districts in this area use that very same process. The piece that gives me peace about it, not only as an administrator in another district, but as a parent, is that piece of law enforcement being the eyes at the same time as law enforcement, on the other hand, also conducting a simultaneous investigation. So for me, that's almost like the wraparound of if law enforcement is telling us that this is a non-credible threat in both realms, which is what I'm hearing they did, um, then it's, it's probably not. Um, now, to your credit, I think that the leadership that's happened in this district to make sure that people are trained appropriately, because threat assessment is actually um, quite new for schools because of the number of gun violence instances that we've had, and the norming of it, the norming of the process is actually quite new. So um, I, I believe that the way that it was handled yesterday was probably the best way that it could have been handled. However, to your point, the fact that the community is not aware of the process is definitely something that we need to address. However, I will share that the entire process is actually online. Our entire emergency protocol is online for every emergency. Lockdown, fire, all of those pieces have to, by law, be visible on the website. And so I would encourage the community to look for that information. I'm actually on it right now because I wanted to make sure that it was here. Um, if you have questions about the process, please ask. Because I will say you're not the first parent that I've seen asked, not only in this district, but in others. Um, just wanting to know, like, what does a school do if? Um, and I think that's really important. And the fact that you came out tonight to be able to ask that question on behalf of multiple families in the community um, is a wonderful thing. And truthfully, I wish more people would come to this microphone and ask us the questions, ask Dr. Luff the questions and his team, as opposed to going to Facebook for the answers. So the kudos is, to you. There's, kudos not to enough, you. there's not enough answers to the questions. Uh, they, you know, living in this town for as long as I have, uh, the fact that we don't know if there were weapons in that home. We, we don't know if those weapons were taken right. away. That's going to scare people, mm -hmm. you know, and I understand that. I wish there can be some disclosure, either from law enforcement, uh, and I understand the school situation, they can't be, but at least law enforcement can issue a statement, everything is copacetic, there were no weapons found, we, we feel secure in that. that I, I was trying to respect the rules of conduct that says, you know, don't go back and forth. So uh, just trying to, I, I actually read it to make sure I, I did. No, I, I guess, yeah, it's more about disclosure and, and including, even if we did our job perfectly here, we're also handing the baton to law enforcement right. who are also, right. right, sheriffs and elected officials. Right. So I think the families are also concerned, okay, what's next? Because right. even if we, whatever we determine, yeah, or nay, we're bound by the rules of conduct, by disclosure. I, I, think, I think we should also band as a family, as a, a community family, mm -hmm. and see what the next step is with law enforcement as well. Because I right. don't really know what the steps are there. And maybe a parent calling the sheriff's office might be different from district representatives calling the sheriff's office and saying, families are still concerned about their response. Again, if not necessarily this child, what the normal procedure is. Right, right. just being right. knowledgeable you know, like, about the procedure. It's right. comforting to hear that the red flag laws are there, mm -hmm. and then like maybe people should petition or something to stay just if certain bullet points are hit, that's a bad term to use in this case, but certain points are hit, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot right. of people that are uneasy, just everyone that I've spoken to so I far. Yeah. I understand. So I, I do want to just clarify, the sheriff reached out to us, so there has been direct conversation with the Putnam County Sheriff regarding this incident. I'm not saying I don't know the answer to those questions. Right, you just can't I do. Can't I just can't disclose. And, and, that, and that right there. But that communication has been, and it's something that uh, it's Sheriff McConville has done a great job in doing in terms of closing the communications gap between the Sheriff's Department right. and the schools. Yep, right. He's been uh, really on top of these things as right. incidents unfold. So. He reached out to me and called me last evening as soon as our 
our, the investigation was underway. Um, so that I'm thankful that line of communication is at least uh, operating efficiently. Right, and I, I think if people still have questions about their process, right, because once law enforcement shows up, the district is yeah. like, it's, it's all about the chain of command in that, in that way um, as to who's more highly qualified to handle an incident, right? And obviously the police are in this instance. So uh, I would encourage people to ask questions of the sheriff's department. Um, you know, I don't know how much we can do to be a bridge in that conversation, Dr. Luff, to just give the sheriff's department a heads up that this was a concern from a citizen of our community that is representing other citizens. The fact of the matter is it's highly alarming right now what is happening in our country. It has everyone heightened. Um, there is no rhyme or reason or pattern to where these things happen. Um, but I do believe that now, more than ever, schools are doing all they can to address mental health, which is at the crux of this issue. Um, and we have certainly done our part in that area here. We hired another mental health counselor, right, um, to be able, or a support person to be at the middle school this year, which I think is imperative because the earlier you deal with these certain issues with kids, the, the less action there is after that, right? Um, and so I think that we're doing what we can do as a district, certainly if the community has other ideas as to how we can support um, and we are legally able to do so. I know that this board and Dr. Luff will do whatever is in our power to do to support so that these items are prevented. But I do think that people should be educated about our process and so does New York State. That's why we're required to have it there on the, on the website. So um, I think people should look at that. And again, if they have questions, because if you're not involved in a school on a regular basis, you may not know our protocols and feel as, as comfortable with them if you just don't know what they are. Um, so people should definitely refer to the website for that. But thank, thank you. Thank you for bringing thank me you. here, um, Any other questions or comments? I'd like a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Second. Third. All approved. Yep. Motion carries. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.